six years, an impressive, groundbreaking force in metal and hard rock has emerged out of Los Angeles, California. In that time, a quartet known as System of a Down, friends as well as bandmates Serge Tankian, Chavo Adagian, John Dalmayan and Darren Malakian, have made a swift transition from novice LA underground heroes to international new metal stars. Seemingly appearing out of thin air, but having sweated and toiled for their success, System of a Down exploded onto the music scene in 1996 and have not looked back since. Uncompromising, innovative, single-minded and blessed with a genius instinct for fusing the best of metal, rock and Middle Eastern music, this remarkable group are perhaps the most original metal band of recent years. Together, System of a Down make a huge skull-pounding noise that combines many styles and sounds, from the obvious to the esoteric, dragging heavy music into a fusion of exciting new possibilities. can be traced back to LA, where the four members all grew up and spent their formative years. Lead vocalist Serge Tankian was actually born in the Lebanon and moved with his family to LA at an early age. His father was a musician and encouraged Serge to play and sing for himself from an early age. Drummer John Dalmayan was also born in the Lebanon but moved to Los Angeles via Toronto. Meanwhile, bassist Shavo Odadjian and guitarist Darren Malakian were born in Armenia and Glendale, California, respectively, the former relocating to LA while still very young. Serge, Darren and Shavo all attended the same Armenian private elementary school in Hollywood, in sight of the famous sign. Serge had already graduated from high school when the others were still in the fourth grade. Their experiences at this school were far from idyllic and left many an imprint on their emotional development. Darren once revealed that he still suffers from nightmares relating to his experiences there. Such was its level of oppression. Teachers allegedly warned him that pupils would be locked in a dark room full of rats if they misbehaved or cried for their mothers. Unsurprisingly, he's associated the school with all things malevolent and evil and has used it as an explanation for his twisted personality and take on life. John did not attend the same school as the others but endured similar experiences at another Armenian school, eventually getting expelled from it. System of a Down was formed in early 1995 when the LA group Soil, featuring Serge and Darren, disbanded in disarray. Serge and Darren, however, refused to be swayed from music making and immediately decided to form a new group. Within a matter of months, old school friend Shavo was recruited, followed by John soon after. The band came together through mutual friends and acquaintances and each member's Armenian heritage was purely coincidental. Shavo explains more about it. Well, we formed in Los Angeles. We um, all met at a rehearsal studio. We, the three of us, knew each other from before, but we weren't really friends or anything. But, but we, uh, we all went to the same ele elementary school. Ironic. But then we all met up at some studio. I was playing with another band. Jaron was playing with another band, and Serge was playing with another band. Well, we changed that band completely, and now we have System. That's how we met, and that's how it all started in a, in a studio. Darren coined the group's name from a poem that he had written called Victims of the Down, 
Chavo objected to the word victims for its narrow personal connotation. So Darren came up with the broader, ambiguous system, which suited everybody and left room for thought and subjective interpretation. System of a Down were born. factors that helped System of a Down in their early years was the rise of street teams and their use in spreading the word on up-and-coming bands. Remember, this was 1995, a few years before the internet really became a viable force for the underground distribution of bands and their music. It's become relatively easy these days for new groups to set up websites and contact directly a loyal and supportive fan base. Back in the mid-90s, all this work had to be done by hand and foot, and so a new development in music culture, the street team, emerged as a vital force in shaping the music now enjoyed today. It took the emerging new metal scene of the mid-90s to motivate a new generation of rock fans, passionate about their music and willing to help out in any way they could. One of the earliest street team members was Vi, who had known the members of the band from an early age. Well, I first met the guys, my brother had given me their demo back in 95. He used to play basketball with uh, Serge and some of the other guys at a local uh, junior high. <clears throat> and I heard the demo and I was like, I didn't know. I couldn't believe he knew these guys, first of all, and it was like new at the time. I didn't know what to think of it, you know. I was kind of scared of, from it, but I just started going to shows and through other acquaintances just met the guys and I knew friends that were going to their school, their previous Armenian school, <clears throat> and it was just like a big little circle of knowing this person and that person, and I eventually was cool with them. New bands like System would recruit loyal followers into a regimented, almost army-like set of factions. These fans would hit the streets running, gathering outside gigs and clubs, distributing flyers, stickers, free demo tapes, in fact anything that would get a new band noticed. In some cases, entire networks spread across the US, with street team captains from different cities recruiting loyal fans into the organization. These passionate and loyal street teams, or beanies as they were known in LA, would then be rewarded for all their hard efforts by getting exclusive access to the band, strictly limited tapes, information packs and invitations to one-off gigs. This was not some half-assed amateur stunt cobbled together on a whim, but a very professional, highly organised long-term operation. System of a Down were one of the key pioneers of this new force, and with the strength of a powerful ethnic fan base behind them, they threw everything they had at it. Local radio DJ Stryker, from the influential rock station K-Rock, has seen firsthand the rise of the street team and the massive effect they've had on music. People that are from LA or live in LA now, if they stumble onto a band by accident, even if they're unsigned, I mean, they will do what it takes for this band to get big. I mean, you can go in front of any club that has bands play, and you leave, and there are 12 different kids out there with flyers to come see a band. And we're just hitting the streets all the time with their little ghetto stickers and flyers, and everyone was like, what the hell is that name, System of a Down, you know? And it sounded like a cool name, because it was kind of controversial, but no one knew what the hell it was anyway, so. In the last few years, access to new music has changed radically and remains one of, if not the greatest development of the new digital internet age. It seems almost laughable now in our CD copying, MP3 world that only a few years ago, the humble cassette tape provided the only economic solution for cheap distribution of new music. It was Darren and Serge's brush with the music business in their previous band, Soil, that reinforced the importance of well-recorded, eye-catchingly designed cassette tapes. These were no mere demo tapes, but carefully crafted, well-packaged mini-albums that the early System of a Down spent much time and money getting recorded, using the best facilities that they could afford at the time. 
The next step was to approach record stores in the area, trying to get them to distribute the tapes. One of the key players in this scene is Backside Records, located in downtown Burbank. Record store owner Jojo was, and still is, a key player in establishing distribution bases for new bands and their music. A real expert on the LA underground rock scene, Jojo and Backside Records were a natural target for Systems Energies. It continues to play a pivotal role with its similar homegrown success story, Linkin Park, who also based their initial assault on the music world from Backside Records. Uh, when we uh, first got approached uh, from actually Shavo, from the basis from System of Down, brought us uh, his demo, I would say in 95. That was the first demo they brought in. We did a consignment with them to see how the record would run. And there's the baby right there. That's the first puppy. And it just pretty much it just went out of the store. There was a great following. Street promotion was heavy. And that's like the most important thing. When you got a good street promotion, you got a good lo loving kids around that love your music, they're going to just spread it out so flavorfully. So it's going to just hit the streets double time. And that's what happened. Underground filmmaker Chris Recker was a keen follower of the scene at the time, collecting many cassette tapes from the underground circuit in his search for the next great thing. Uh, I remember I got my first tape, I believe, right before the first album came out. Uh, it, was a, it was a promo, it was a promotional tape. Uh, you could get them at some of the local record stores, some of the underground record stores, uh, stuff like that. And this, these two were the ones that came later and we were selling at Backside. I was still, I didn't even work here at the time. There was a coffee shop across the street me and my friends used to go to. And just the word spread, like I said, on the streets, you know, about the tapes and stuff, because the internet wasn't big then. And we used to come here and check it out, and we used to buy like four or five, give them to our friends, you know what I mean? It seems amazing to think that these tapes, some of which now change hands for hundreds of dollars amongst system fans, were originally produced to be given away. One of the band's greatest achievements at this time was to limit the amount of cassettes in each run to a couple of hundred, giving the tapes importance amongst, even then, a growing fan base. I remember when Shava walked in and he was mentioning that they're going to get a, a verbal interview on K-Rock and he was excited about that and when that happened it just pretty much went from there and we just got calls after calls uh, about system left and right you know if we've been carrying their stuff and because we just kept selling out over and over again and they didn't they couldn't like reproduce so many tapes because you know cassettes there's only so much but uh as soon as i got it man there was something about I mean, I was already a fan of not only heavy metal music, hard rock, whatever you want to call it, but other types of music, you know, an all-around type of music person, whatever you want to call it. Well, when I heard System Went Down, there was something different about it from everything else. I'm not sure if it's the style, the rhythmic style of the, 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 the singing going along with, with some of the goofy, I'm not going to say goofy, but some of the interesting guitars, you know, some of uh, I mean, just overall, it has just a whole hard, heavy, punk rock kind of uh, aggression towards the system, towards, you know, uh, towards, you know, being suppressed, you know, just kind of a, an overall word, but it just, it's, it's, it's just said with so much, almost, almost beautiful, it's beautiful music. Uh, street promotion, if you got a good street team, good looking, uh approach on that, a good good strong vibe the kids are passing out the flyers promoting your album whether it's anything in life clothing line whatever I mean promotion street promotion is the number one thing one-on-one -on -one, flyer handing out that's the most important thing and that's what gave him the gave him the rundown that's what gave him the hype and it's not a kid doing it to make three dollars an hour it's a kid that saw this band play and was like man these guys are good and they'll just pass out flyers. Everywhere I would, every time I go to a club or something, I would just see flyers or some sort of a handout with their name on it. And their stickers and all that. I remember when Bahia was wearing their beanie and I was just like, what band is that? Before it was all happening. And that's how I mean I get introduced with a lot of good bands to a lot of my friends. The 
next stage for System was to try to get some record company attention. They knew the only way to achieve this was to play some of the important rock venues in LA. Like many of the big cities in America, LA supports a well-defined stepladder of band venues, from your small bars, church and school halls, right up to the large purpose-built rock venues such as the Roxy, the Whiskey A Go Go, the Troubadour and the latest Johnny Depp's Viper Room. System of a Down were fortunate to have such historic and well-established venues literally on their doorsteps. Located on Hollywood's Sunset Boulevard, only a mile down the road from their little Armenian upbringing. Unfortunately, it wasn't all good news. For LA's reputation as the home of US rock attracted and still attracts literally thousands of new bands into the city. Owner of the Roxy, Nick Adler, has seen many hundreds of bands come and go and appreciates what it takes for a new group to stand out in this volatile market. LA is such a hard market because it, we see so many, so much music and we're so, I don't know what the word is, we're just spoiled almost with music that uh, when it does turn our head and we do say, oh, forget about what we think it is cool and this is cool, you know, uh, then it seems like that band is, is the next big one to break. But when you go back to, okay, well, we got to start going out there and seeing how we're going to fill Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday with local bands and start going through hundreds and hundreds of demo tapes. And then you get that one band that, that starts to do well. And, and then other bands see that. And it started with the, with Korn and, and Deftones. And then, uh, then it was System and Snot and Incubus. The key to getting a gig at one of these venues is to show that you have the ability to draw a big enough crowd. Although these large clubs do support talented bands, at root they are mainly interested in tickets and beer sales. So developing a fan base loyal enough to regularly pay up was the key. This is where System Street promotion really paid off. May 28, 1994 was our first show ever, and it was at the Roxy, and we had no demo, nothing. It was really hard to get shows in LA, but I just pumped. I just, every day, like I called like seven, eight times to the same places, and I'm like, hey, it's me again. Just letting you know that we can pack this place. Give us a show. No, you have to have a demo tape. You got to go through this. You got to sell tickets. Raw, raw, raw. And then, so we did all that, and we ruled. After after the second time we played, there was no more selling tickets, no more nothing, and we just progressed. We stayed in L.A., played everywhere in L.A., anywhere you can name, we played. There's so many bands here in L.A., and they all want to play the clubs. But there's so many clubs, even clubs that aren't even famous, where bands will will play. And plus, uh, I know there's nights on Mondays where. It's not an open night, but basically you sign up and you can play. And if you can just develop, develop the smallest of following, that's going to be your ammunition to get into the famous small clubs out here. The first time the Roxy had heard of them was in uh, 1995. There was a promoter named Brian Markovich who would rent the Roxy out on Friday and Saturday, Sunday nights, and, and promote and bring in their own bands and stuff. And I believe their first show was uh, on a Sunday, and they brought in 150 people, and which was, you know, definitely at that time for any kind of local band was, you know, whoa, what's going on here? Started going to the shows. First one was at the, what was it, the Anti Club? It was like a little house kind of place. With Snot, they played. Almost died there. LA-based rock journalist Paul Rogers has spent much time with the band. Although he was not aware of System during this period, he has since interviewed them on numerous occasions and has a vast knowledge of how the new metal scene developed during the 90s. System of a Down are a truly LA act. You know, they went to high school here, as you know. Uh, some of them knew each other from high school. So they're total fish out of water in the scene here in that respect. And that certainly helped their early fan base because the problem a lot of bands here have is that they just don't have that groundswell of just friends and family to come to their early shows. They come out here and they just don't know anybody and they're asking, you know, industry folks to come along but they just don't have any friends and fans whereas System was the opposite. You know, they they just left high school and, or, when they started the band so they still had all these buddies um, which they were able to use as a springboard um, to start building up the, the, uh, the sellout crowds they had down on the strip very early on. Uh, Eddie Ortel at the time came in and he was our sound guy, our booker, the guy who answered the phones, he kind of did everything. He was, he was the beginning of the new Roxy and actually turned out to be the whole new metal scene, but we didn't real, realize at that point. 
And on Tuesday nights, he did a show, uh, a weekly thing called the New HQ. Uh, it was all the new talent. It was free if you were over 21. And it was something every week where you know you could go see the hot new band. At this time, the Roxy was trying out a new method of getting bands into their club. Such was the scale of the underground rock scene in the mid-90s that the venue started to offer bands pre-sale deals to sort the men out from the boys. This basically involved groups paying out quite a considerable amount of cash up front before the Roxy booked them. Only those bands such as System, who were confident enough or foolhardy enough to undertake such a risk, would be booked. People look at the Sunset Strip or they look at the clubs up here and say, you know, why does the band need a pre-sale? Why do they have to pay money to come play your club? Well, at the same time, you're, those people have to go out and do hand-to-hand -hand combat with people and put a ticket in their fan and I mean, in their hand and, and shake their hand and say, come to my show. And, and that's how you really get fans, you know, on this level. You can't just play the Roxy and, and just think that, you know, you're going to get fans. You have to get them there every time, three or four times, and then they're fans for life. Well, one of, one of the most violent ones probably was at the Whiskey about a year after that demo came out. It was with Far and Downset, and it was just chaos. It was just Far played, then System played, and during System it was just, because there was a lot of the Downset fans too that hadn't heard of System. The Downset fans, if you know Downset, are just ridiculous crazy, you know, so it was just the pit from the stage all the way to the bar, and it was fun. You hear a decent band in LA, I mean, you're most likely gonna go see them in LA again. And you're, you know, every time they come around, LA fans are basically, what I'm saying is, they're pretty, they're pretty straightforward. I mean, I mean, if they like something, they like something. If they don't, and you're in an LA club, and there's a band, and the people, local people don't like it, you're gonna know, because people are most likely gonna start throwing stuff on stage, you know what I'm saying? The last tape system recorded began circulating through the metal underground and helped spread their fan base through Southern California, Europe and even New Zealand. The three tracks captured the band's explosive live performance and started to surface amongst the important movers and shakers of the LA rock scene. And then this is pretty much the last one that they made that got them where they are right now. It was with no war and people. Quality was better on this one too. I mean, I'm also a producer too, so I know that sound. I know that what, there's a certain hook or a certain verbal approach that the kids want to hear. And as um, soon as you hear these demos, anywhere from System and a, th a hundred different bands we've been hearing, you just know. And once I heard the demo and just off the approach of the band, you just knew they were going to hit. And they did, and it's just amazing. All the love to them, you know. Uh, with System of a Down, being from Los Angeles, and being Armenian, people that are from LA like to root for bands that are from LA. They li it's like when your best friend plays minor league baseball, and it, or he went to your high school, you want, you want this guy to make it to the pros. It's kind of like that with bands from LA. They're playing the Roxy, now they're selling it out. I want them to get a record deal. One of System's early fans was well-respected producer and recording engineer Sylvia Massey. Sylvia was based in LA and had built up a formidable reputation through her work with Tool and Love and Rockets. A well-known face on the local LA metal scene, Sylvia was passionate about music and kept her ear very close to the ground in her search for new talent. In 1997, having followed System of a Down from an early age, it was Sylvia who first persuaded infamous producer and record company owner Rick Rubin to check out the group at the Viper Room. You know, there, you could do the room two or three times and do 300 and 300 and 400, but when you have that big explosive show and you put the 500, 600 people in there, then you are the next band that's going to, you know, be on the radio and be on MTV. And Ruben was amazed at what he saw. Not only the incredible performance of the band and their music, but the fanatical response of the audience. He was witnessing something fresh and exciting, the birth of a new force in metal music. But Ruben wasn't the only music biz professional there that night. Definitely, right from the jump, it was an Armenian. They knew they could count on their 100, their 150 Armenian uh, fans to be there every every show, no matter what. So they'd always have, you know, their their following. But what would also happen is, is as soon as System of a Down would go off, you know, the room would empty and the next band wouldn't. None of the fans stayed over for the next band. It was definitely they were there to see System. They showed up. Right when it was over, they were out of there. The word spread and 
the shows were always sold out. By the second, third show, it was packed, you know. Whether it was all friends or locals, you know, it was always, it was always a packed show. You could not even enter. It's like, it was so overcrowded and they had their families there, which was all love. That's the best. When you get their parents over there, just loving every moment of it. By now, System had been generating a considerable buzz in the music industry, and their shows had started to draw a sizable number of music industry executives from many of LA's top record companies. In fact, unbeknown to Rubin at this time, System had already been offered contracts from other companies. But confident from the start of their abilities, System were shrewdly holding out to see what noise they could make. There then followed a very exciting few months for the band. Once the intentions of Rubin had been leaked, many other bigger labels started making offers as the huge buzz surrounding the band grew. Rubin's American recordings invited the band to sign up, but initially System declined. Rubin continued to hound them relentlessly, showing up at all of their gigs, trying to prove how much of a fan he really was. He even flew over to New York to attend a legendary CMJ convention gig where, farcically, the band were rumoured to have already signed to Cherry Universal Records. Eventually, in September 1997, System of a Down signed to American Records after Rubin had guaranteed to personally produce their first album. System were huge fans of Rubin, who had production credits on many of their favourite albums, from legends such as Slayer and the Red Hot Chili Peppers, to the Beastie Boys and Public Enemy, an eclectic and diverse range of genres that swiped broadly through the band members' own personal music influences. An offer from The Master to handle the reins of their first album was the icing on the cake, and one that System of a Down could not refuse. During the first months of 1998, System of a Down were holed up with Rubin in LA's famous Sound City Studios. Situated in an unremarkable industrial part of North LA, Sound City was a shrewd choice by Rubin for the band's first professional recording sessions. Located within easy reach of the group's Glendale bass, the studio's relaxed, down-to-earth vibe worked well for the members who were required to drain themselves emotionally day after day. Rubin had used the studio many times before, and knew Sound City's mix of tried and tested analog equipment would contribute greatly to the band's organic sound, as it had done for many famous albums tracked there before. Sylvia Massey was an obvious choice to engineer the album, a role she threw herself into with an energy only matched by the band's own. Sylvia and the band dreamt up a bewildering range of recording techniques, particularly for Serge's vocals. These included hanging the singer upside down, recording him in the street, the hall and the toilet. Studio manager Siobhan O'Brien. Basically, Sylvia Massey had told me about the band um, before they were signed. Uh, they were playing around town and they were actually doing a pretty huge draw. Um, so there was quite a few labels going after them. It was pretty much a bidding war. And, uh, but she just loved the band. And she was so excited about it. And, um, so she was really campaigning to get the project. And then Rick Rubin came in under the radar and signed him. So uh, after that was when we got the call, they booked the studio to come in and track the first record. Looking as an outsider who's only chatted with, with Rick Rubin briefly, his MO always seems to have been that he uh, takes a lot of the pretension out of the bands he works with. And technically speaking, he works with a relatively small amount of sound sources, but they're very high quality sound sources. For example, when he came across the Cult, they had already recorded the entire electric album using like 128 tracks of everything. They weren't happy with it. So he said, okay, let's just go back to basics. And if you've heard the electric, electric album, you know, it almost sounds like a demo tape, you know. Um, and that's always been his MO. And I think that's what he brought to the first System of a Down album. It's very raw, it's very in your face, it's mastered really, really hot, almost painfully hot in places. The first time I heard System, you know, um, you know listening to the demos, um, it, it, there's something completely different. And that's important. And they did it well. Um, and like with Sound City, we have a history of, of bands breaking on their first records, but all those records, Nirvana, Rage Against the Machine, it's like it was something completely different, which is something the labels don't grasp, unfortunately. That, you know, if you let an artist do, be true to their music and do what they do, you'd be surprised. But unfortunately, 
you know, um, if the band hits, you know, like Blink-182, they'll sign 20 other bands that sound like Blink-182. And I think um, even with System, because System was had a bit of like the Rage Against the Machine vibe going, this is what their interest, but, you know, like with Rick Rubin and Sylvia Massey, they, it was more the Middle Eastern vibe, and also the fact that Serge's lyrics are very, very political. In terms of his relationship with the band and how he affects their relationships, I think he's very, very important. First off, because I think it's one of the bands he feels the greatest empathy with. I don't want to call it his pet project, but I think he's very, very close to that band, and it's one of the real long-term uh, things in his vision. Rick is, 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 is really a music fan, um, hardcore, um, which makes him a great producer. And, uh, you know, uh, he's not so much on the technical aspect of the actual uh, control room, but he's more a musician and a fan, which it shows in his work. Um, he, gets, he was excited about System, you know, and you could tell that immediately. He was raring to go. Um, and I think together they, they worked well together. You know, they um, obviously, the reason why System went with American, because like I said, there was a bidding more. They probably could have got more money off another label was they're a huge Rick Rubin fan. They admired his work, you know, um, that he's done over the years, and I think that's why they made that decision to go with him. And it's worked out well, you know, because not only are they on American, but they get Rick Rubin as a producer, you know, so they were really, it was a good, good deal for them. And, um, yeah, their work ethics were great. You know, they were always here on time, except for Shavo. Shavo's usually late. <laughs> It was kind of a one-stop shopping exercise for the band. They didn't have to please, you know, a whole A&R department and please this and please that and go shopping for producers and worry about their, the politics at the label. It was all in one guy. And it was one guy who totally believed in them and just basically told them to get on with it. So he brought them an awful lot of freedom, I think, and an awful lot of security because once they knew he understood them and was on board with them, they were kind of home and dry. That's been a big part of just letting those guys get on with it. I, working day usually started around uh, noon and we go till you know, midnight or one o'clock in the morning, you know, 12, 13 hours a day, six days a week, one day off, you know. Um, so it, yeah, it's a lot of work for the musicians to come in. And it, usually, especially like the, when they first start, we're doing drums, so then you've got John in there, and that's probably the hardest part for the drummer because they are such a physical job and they're working long hours. They really are getting killed in there, you know, and then, it, you know, then we'll lead on to vocals and, and guitar overdubs eventually, but you, basic tracks is like the drummer. You know, after Sylvia gets the drum sound and, and bass and guitars, um, you know, we'll do scratch vocals at the same time. So the band is playing live to 24, and you basically want to get the best drum tracks, what we call like, it's the basic tracks or the foundation, which is the bass and drums. Obviously, if you get a great vocal take or a great guitar take, you're just going to go ahead and keep it. But usually you'll go over and, and overdub those later. So yeah, the first week of tracking, every focus is on the poor drummer. But once he, he's done, he can hang in the lounge and relax, <laughs> which they usually do. But yeah, John, John was great. He was definitely up to the job, you know, and especially systems music, because it's, it, it's intense, especially for the drummer, you know, but uh, he did a great job. And that, uh, you know, that was before people were wheeling in Pro Tools all the time. You know, which, uh, you know, in Pro Tools, you can basically chop up the drums, knock stuff into tune, you know, and, and all that stuff. There was no Pro Tools on the basic tracks on system. They were really focused on, on the record, which is great, because sometimes you'll get a band in on their first record, and they think, oh, you know, they're signed, it's, it's time to have a good time and party. No, that wasn't system at all. They were very focused on what they were doing. Um, yeah, there is a pressure there, you know. Your label is putting a lot of money down for you, and in their case, the head of the label was producing the record, so yeah. They definitely, they needed guidance. I mean, you know, um, definitely they had, they knew what direction they were going in and what their music is about, and they weren't going to compromise that at any means. And I don't think Rick would ask them to do that either, because Rick just loved the band as well. Um, but, you know, they needed a little bit of guidance, but as far as their musicianship or the chops, yeah, they were definitely up and ready to go. The release of their first album, the self-titled System of a Down, was hailed as a breakthrough in metal music. Here was a perfectly realised, fully formed piece of metal heritage, refreshingly clear of self-indulgence and totally fat-free. Kids these days, 
are not into like what's in the middle. They want extreme. Hot tea or cold tea? Lincoln Park system, corn, tool, whatever. Hot tea gets you going, it gets you crazy. Who wants to just stand in the middle these days? And uh, I mean, let's be honest, the music gets you going, excited, hyper, camaraderie, fun. With system, brings you some, some kind of knowledge. We don't agree with it all, some of it we do. But uh, I think that's why it's so popular. And there's obviously, there's something to the songs with the melody and the yelling, back to melody, the lyrics, the music. No one had heard anything like it, you know? And that was the, uh, the whole point, the way it was so stop-start, and we hadn't heard any vocals like that before. But I didn't really register that System of a Down were anything that special in my consciousness until I ran across the video for the song Spiders, which they had had on some uh, movie soundtrack. And I thought the quality of the songwriting was so good that I assumed it was a cover version. Not to be disrespectful because to a system of a day who I understand a lot better now, but at the time they were just another kind of new metal band on the, the, the periphery of my, my consciousness. And uh, that really, really shocked me. It shocked me even more when I found out it wasn't a cover version. Savage lyrics and screeching riffs combined with well-crafted harmonies and melodies. It was great to hear music by a group with no membership of any musical club and no ambition beyond making truthful, heartfelt music. The System of a Down album redefined the landscape of world rock and set a precedent for the new century. Drawing on metal, punk, as well as subtle European and Middle Eastern influences, the sound got under the skin of audiences and fellow musicians alike. Voiced by Serge's distinctive pounding delivery, System of a Down took the listener to new realms of rhythmic, melodic and lyrical chaos. Darren's beefy, occasionally minimalist guitar work set the tone for the band's dense, ultra-heavy sound, ably assisted by John's skull-crushing drums and Charvo's reverberating bass. There's a range of influences going on here. I mean, they are influenced by... One thing about American musicians, as opposed to British musicians, is that the whole... For one, Kiss, everyone's influenced by Kiss here. It seems like every musician you meet um, from like their mid-twenties older was hugely influenced by Kiss. And the, the kind of hair metal thing in general was just huge over here, you know. I mean, Motley Crue were household names here, whereas in England it was always a kind of specific, kind of cliquey thing. Um, so they were, I think they heard their share of that. I know Darren was uh, very fond of a lot of what we'd call the more extreme metal, the, you know, he listened to a lot of Cannibal Corpse and all that extreme stuff that was coming out of Florida. And you can hear that in some of his playing now, I think. Um, but then the kind of twist on that was they, I think they were also very impressed, or certainly some of the members, by some of the more free-thinking bands uh, that came along later on, like uh, Faith No More and uh, Jane's Addiction, who weren't so uh, genre-specific, you know, who, who took things from here and there and made a kind of collage out of it sonically. Um, and then, of course, grunge came along, and again, I think, that, uh, that affected most musicians who were playing guitars, really, in terms of uh, being less, less pretentious, you know, and, and more to the point. And uh, I think System of a Down bring a lot of those elements of all those genres to the table. Throughout the records, the music takes many unexpected turns, starting in full-on metal mode, descending into Middle Eastern rhythms and hammering out numbing riffs before cranking up for a powerful ending. The band recalled the work of the Dead Kennedys, particularly in their lyrical concerns, which ranged from remote satellite viewing and mind control to conspiracy theories about the USA's attempt at global domination. A fusion of alternative metal and programmed beats, augmented by subtle Eastern European influences, earned them comparisons with contemporary metal bands like the Deftones and Korn. But the sharpest reviewers were quick to pick up on this band's boundary-pushing edge and beguiling corrosive power. Musical qualities that helped shift more than 850,000 copies. They like to play down the fact that there's any kind of um, Armenian influence or exotic influence in their music and that's not for me to say but the fact is that to my white boy western ears a lot of it certainly sounds very exotic you know um, they're certainly using harmonies that rock bands don't use 
they're certainly using instrumentation that rock bands don't use. And to me right now with System of a Down, it's kind of a game of two halves. Some of, the, in, with the heavy passages, it doesn't sound quite so remarkable to me. Some of that's fairly generic. It's the mellow passages they, they intersperse with them that sound uh, so unique to me, where, like I said, they can really exploit those harmonies, where you can really hear Serge's voice, which is a huge part of why they sound so unusual. Um, and again, where they start using the unusual instrumentation that uh, certainly I haven't heard in a, in a hard rock context before. The, just, there's so many different parts of different styles of music in a system of down song or CD. I mean, not only do you hear hard guitars, but you'll also hear, you know, some instruments I can't even pronounce. I don't know if it's like a Middle Eastern feel, but it just kind of makes, I love the way Serge chants and kind of like, you know what I'm saying? It's, it's hard, you feel it, but it also kind of touches you, like as being something that, that other people could appreciate, you know, if they just kind of kind of heard past the hard guitars and stuff like that and kind of walked away from looking at it as a label type of music like all punk music, punk kids, yada yada, when it's actually something that anybody can relate to. I mean if you look at System of Down's fan base, it's so widespread and like I said diversified. There's so many different types of people. I mean it's not just 13 year old kids that go to high school that watch MTV, that buy the CD, then buy the shirt that keep System of a Down going. No, it's the fans that go to the shows that sell them out, that, you know, that, that, that want to see the band. They want to support the band. They're just not buying a ticket to be cool. It's what you're looking for. I mean, you could be in a bad mood, put it on, you'd be in a good mood. You could be in a, in kind of a, a cranky mood, you put it on, you'd be in like a pumped mood. You know what I mean? Regardless of anything, I think it hits the spot. The System of a Down album topped critics' and readers' polls worldwide and subsequently helped land high-profile touring slots with Slayer and the 98 Ozfest. Playing at these prestigious shows was like a dream come true for System of a Down, who had all worshipped Slayer and Ozzy for as long as they'd been interested in music. their whole career, much has been made of the band's political views. Although some of Serge's lyrics do deal with serious issues, it would be unfair to label System as a political band. Similar comments have also surfaced about the group's Armenian roots, as if their motive all along has been to carry the flag of Armenian new metal music. Rock bands, however great, have unfortunately always needed some point of entry for journalists and the media to latch onto. The band themselves are the first to admit that their Armenian heritage serves a useful purpose for this and that it could be a lot worse. I think them being Armenian really helped them develop a core following in the beginning because from what I've learned from talking to the guys, Armenians really stick together, whether you know them or not. So if John, the drummer from System, knows an Armenian kid, they'll tell him, hey, you know, we have this band, we're playing at this club, they'll spread it throughout the Armenian community. And that's, from, that's what I learned from them, and I think being Armenian only helped them in the beginning, but obviously the music totally speaks for itself. I mean, you, you don't have to sell, you know, they're, they're unbelievable. But in the very beginning, I think, uh, I think it helped them. In the beginning, uh, I remember hearing a lot of bad things about them being Armenian and playing this kind of music, because everyone thought it was just the ignorant, more like, old school, uh, old fashioned kind of parents or even the kids that just listen to either rap or nothing. Everyone thought it was bad and what they're doing doesn't sound right and they're not going to get anywhere. And as soon as they start hearing, they hit the radio. I remember p people like appreciating it more and thinking, damn, they are Armenian and <clears throat> they have spread the word for our community, you know, whether it was for the genocide or the fact that they're Armenian. So. I can paraphrase what the band have told me. Yes, a big deal has been made about them being an Armenian band or an Armenian metal band, which the band literally laugh about. I mean, because what, what is an Armenian metal, you know? Um, they claim the fact that they're Armenian is purely coincidental in as much as they're a bunch of high school buddies who formed a band, basically. The fact was, because of where they lived, the majority of kids at their high school were Armenian they would have had to go out of their way to have non-Armenians in the band, if you know what I mean. So 
it, it's like any other kind of organic band that a bunch of you know young guys form. You, you form it amongst the people you know and the people you can play. And when they hired uh, John, who was the last the last guy in, as it were, um, it wasn't a case of they were advertising you know Armenian drummer wanted. It's just again they they knew of the guy and he lived in the same neighborhood and. Especially interesting because uh, you don't see many bands from Armenian descent. And a lot of people, from my personal reference, I honestly uh, wasn't aware of a lot of Middle Eastern countries and a lot of the smaller countries until I actually listened to some System of a Down, you know? I didn't even know where Armenia was, you know what I'm saying? It's just interesting, that's just another interesting factor. I mean, all the little bits and pieces of System of a Down is what makes it a good band. I mean, not only do you have something that's different, but yet something you can relate to, yet something that kicks ass. You know what I'm saying? So I mean, dude, it's just a, it's a great medley, you know? System also having the Armenian, you know, following, they already have that, but then just kids in general are, are, are that passionate about their music as well, and they don't even understand the whole conflict that, where their music is coming from, but they just, they just want to be, they want to be down, you know? They want to be down with, with what System is talking about, and, and I know they get a lot of kids maybe thinking about things that they would never think about, you know, maybe listening to a Linkin Park or a Papa Roach, systems bringing more of a world political view to it where it's like, you know, it's not all about me, it's like, hey, let's open up and see kind of what's going on. Um, one of the reasons why I like System is their political message is not forced down your throat. Some songs are political, the whole record, especially the new one, Toxicity, is not political, 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 political. Then they have a song, Jump, Bounce, Bounce, and they have a song about groupies, but then they, you know, they talk about issues, and they talk about uh, politics, and it's done in a way where it's not, this is what's going on, except in the prison song, maybe, when they talk about jail. That's actually down your throat, but the way it's done, I love it. But personally, why I like them, and why I think people like me dig system and are passionate about them because the message is not forced down your throat and I don't think the band cares if you disagree with them. As Shavo said in the interview I did with those guys, you know, they're, they're not complaining, they think that the fact that they're all from that background leaves a lot of things unsaid between them that, that only strengthens their bond, you know, it, it means they don't have to keep spelling out each other's kind of moral stance to each other because they've all been raised that way. But they are forced to discuss it all the time, I don't think they would it would come up very much if they weren't asked about it, you know. And like I said, they, they, they deny any kind of Armenian influence in their music, even though I hear it. But They want you to pick a side of the fence and build a house. Have an opinion, whatever it is, cool. System says, we have an opinion, here it is. Like it? Okay, cool. I don't care if you like it. A self-confessed workaholic, Darren began writing songs for the second album while the band was still busy mixing the debut. Most of the tracks were composed in the wee small hours of the morning, often between 4 and 7 o'clock. Darren beavered away all night and before he knew it he'd seen the sun rising. Trying to improve upon a debut which reached number one on the Billboard Heat Seekers chart and shifted more than 850,000 units would take some doing. But the obsessive perfectionist streak in Darren and the rest of the band ensured they were more than up to the task. System hold themselves up in the famous Los Angeles cello studios from February 2001 onwards, aided and abetted by a sonic dream team. Rick Rubin produced at cello, while engineer Andy Wallace of Nirvana and Rage Against the Machine fame worked on post-production at the nearby Enterprise Studios. The aim was to reinvent themselves, to be bigger, louder, better, and even more creative than last time. They wanted to stretch themselves by writing lots of material and reaching out in different directions. It was evident that the quality of the tunes were so high that the ones to miss the cut would have to be released as bonus tracks or B-sides for future singles. 
The album's guest collaboration came courtesy of multi-instrumentalist virtuoso Arto, who'd previously worked with jazz giants such as Wayne Shorter, Chet Baker and Al Di Miola. He laid down vocal as well as instrumental tracks, playing everything from a Coke bottle to a bucket of water. I went late flight and I was going to just going to meet them, you know, say hello, and I, I, mean, I never meet them, I don't know who they are, and they were sitting there, especially there, and it was like, hey, how are you doing, you know, <laughs> yeah, okay, and then they say, are you ready, I'm like, what, ready, I'm, I was supposed to do it tomorrow, you know, the session, <laughs> but, you know, little drink, little thing, 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 wink, wink, all my mind open, and then I start doing the session. And I went in, I put the headphone, and when the sound came, I never feel in my life anything like that. It was like, like all from here to down. I was like, ah. <laughs> certainly, certainly his vocals have an unusual accent, which I think is a part of it. Also, I think the most striking passages are often when he is, is harmonizing with Darren, and they really have that thing down. Until I saw them live, which was relatively recently, I didn't appreciate how well they can put that away live. And another thing which I had misunderstood, and I think a lot of listeners do, is there are passages on the albums which I'd attributed to Serge, which are in fact Darren singing. What I feel with them, in, I am young enough to have hope, and I am old enough to survive with them. You know, they, they make me young to, like, I have hope, you know, like this. It will stay like that because they are, they are really, really wonderful person. Serge is undoubtedly a very well-educated and well-read man. He has an abiding fascination with US foreign policy and its ramifications, and he's very eloquent about it. When I interviewed the guy, sadly, I couldn't use 95% of what he said to me because it would have been like a whole book in itself. And I couldn't, in the space of my article, I couldn't even like go down that road, you know, um, which was a shame because all the stuff was very, very quotable. The originally in that session, I did like two piece. I work with their music, but other than that, I did like four or five different pieces uh, by myself. Because for me, it's like an instrument is me. This is my instrument. What is the tools? It can be table, it can be water, it can be cooking pot, it can be bottle, it can be whistle, it can, you know, they give me like hope, you know, I feel like I'm young, young, I, I, I end up very young in the, after that session, you know. I think uh, as a, uh, as a songwriting talent, as a composing talent, the kid is just the real deal. I mean, he, if you listen to their music and you've read interviews with other bands, you'd expect him to be some kind of bohemian, you know, pretentious artiste living out here in Hollywood. And he's quite the opposite. He, and he doesn't seem to have come from a background where other members of his family were, you know, I mean, they were in artistic pursuits, but they weren't doing the band thing. Um, a talent for composing songs and a drive to do it, which he finds hard to define, it's just something he does. Like most you know, true artists, he just gets up in the morning and just does it. Arto and System recorded a number of Armenian incantations that eventually led to the beautiful piece Arto, found at the end of the album as a hidden track. Darren, he say, why, why we always have to have funeral like like always with down, you know, like. And when he was talking about this thing and then, then talking about the songs and thing, I say, oh, okay, you know, that's, that's for how the last track could become create, you know. The originally, that, that last track is like really heavy, choir type of song, you know, like really, but in a way, it's very beautiful. How, how these things develop in those days in Anatolia, you know, no electric, no entertainment, no nothing, you know. The church is important because people coming together, singing and talking, and thing, you know. But we wanted to give a little fresh approach for our, our believings, you know. That's the way we create that less track. Like when they, when they give me the, the, all this open opportunity, I was like, in a way, like, I said, whoa, what is this? Like, it's my album, and then, long time I didn't feel like that, you know? Like, I, I, even even my own album, when I go, it's, it's, I'm not that free, you know? <laughs> they were seeing something, 
So they, they, that's what I like them very much because they were so smart. They say, let this guy put it out what he had and see what we can, what is matching for our picture. Which is it's like, I think it's very modern way of approaching how to get it out. First, first couple of hours, we were like, yeah, let's do music. Yeah, okay, okay, you wanna do this? Just whatever you want, just four o'clock morning. I said, man, four o'clock morning, how are you gonna find? No, no problem, we'll be fine. I say, okay, then I understand what opportunity I have. As Rick Rubin said in the, the interview he gave with me, Darren does have a very unusual sense of, uh, of melody and a very high level of musicality amongst people who make heavy music. And uh, Rubin made an interesting comparison with Queen. Not that the system of dance sounded anything like Queen, but in terms of, you know, Queen were a band in their time who were unusual, had an unusual sense of musicality amongst heavy bands, if you look at the, their contemporaries. And that's where Rubin puts uh, Darren's songwriting today. And I, and I can see that, or I, or I certainly think that's where it's headed. It's, it's beautiful, you know, because I don't look at the music as a category or as a style. I only look at the music as a one thing, you know. But I really care about what is behind, what is the message. Is it positive, negative, or hate, or, you know, all those things. Toxicity was released in August 2001. Impressive as their debut album was, Toxicity actually makes their earlier release sound drab, one-dimensional and nondescript in comparison. Still rich with trademark quirks, fits and flagrant disregard for convention, the album nonetheless finds the group exploring melody, albeit in relentlessly heavy fashion. Toxicity became a massive hit throughout the entire world, shifting millions of copies in the process and catapulting the band to the top of album charts throughout many countries. Toxicity was also number one in the American Billboard charts during the traumatic events of September the 11th. Many people actually mistook the band's messages in songs such as Jet Pilot as prophecy, an idea rigorously denied by the group themselves. On its release, System immediately started a huge worldwide tour where they continued to relentlessly promote their groundbreaking album for the world to discover. Charvo from the band explains what it's like. There's pros and cons, but I enjoy it. I'm, I'm, I'm a road dog. I love the road life. After the first three months, I was like, I ain't going back. But then I go back and then I get into home life and I like home. And then they send us out again. The first two days, it's kind of hard adjusting. And then all of a sudden, I'm back becoming a road dog. You know? And I'm just like crazy on the road. It's like two, two different yeah, personalities, I guess. It's like road life, home life, different. You know, I can't guzzle down a bottle of Jack Daniels at home. You know, but I could on the road. <laughs> when I go home, I become a pig. As a big thank you to all their fans for supporting Toxicity, System and radio station K-Rock organised a free outside concert in Hollywood, close to the band's Armenian home. This generous gesture marking Labor Day 2001 was promoted heavily by K-Rock and led to huge legions of fans turning up on the day. Underground filmmaker Chris Recker was part of the enormous crowd who gathered expectantly around the streets off Sunset Boulevard that day. Yada yada, we got a free show going on in K-Rock, so what do we do? Everybody heads down there on the day that it was supposed to be said on the radio. Uh, a lot of people showed up. I mean, we're in the middle of, uh, middle of Hollywood. When I walked up, there was at least 400 to 500 people piling into the streets off the sidewalks. You had LAPD telling people, obviously getting frustrated with the situation, they had no idea that System of Down would turn out a crowd like this. But basically, as you know, the, the whole thing was massively uh, oversubscribed. They expected 3,000 fans and an estimated 10,000 showed up. So, I mean, the LAPD started getting frustrated when, a lot of, when, uh, when they actually announced that they weren't going to be letting more people into the show because of, they've already exceeded the amount of people. 
you know, it, they started, they blocked off the whole block and were only allowing people in that had wristbands that were passed out earlier. Stuff that wasn't mentioned before. You had people jumping over fences, cutting through people's uh, apartments to try to sneak into this free show that the LAPD wasn't letting people in. Hey, look at that shit, man. Everybody and their moms going in, man. How'd all those people? Obviously, System have a real hardcore fan base. And some of these kids had traveled and they'd been there all day and it was a hot day. No announcement was made, apparently. This was, seemed to be the big problem, that the fire marshal said, OK, this is not going to happen, but they didn't get up and tell anybody. Chris and his friends eventually broke into the concert where they waited for the band to come on. It just seemed like, you know, where's the band? You know, a half hour goes by, 40 minutes, people standing there in front of the stage chanting. I mean, I would think this would pull them out. Slowly but surely, I mean, stuff started just coming off the stage and people started realizing, you know what? I don't think this free show is going to happen. A, a, a roadie got up and just started removing one of these banners, and that's when the kids figured out this thing wasn't going to happen. They weren't stupid. People started getting upset. They started blaming basically the police, the promoters. They basically didn't give a shit anymore. System of a Down wasn't on the stage, so they were going to throw shit at the stage. A couple security guards had to drag the one guy off the stage that was, that was fighting with one of the other security guards. As soon as they got him off stage, more stuff started flying on the stage. Batteries beer bottles. They weren't even selling alcohol at the show and there were so many damn beer bottles flying. Piled up monitors started being ripped down off the stage. You had monitors just landing in the crowds of people. Then you had the people starting to take the monitors and run off with, you know, three people carrying a monitor back to their car or wherever they tried to take it. And then there was just more and more kids coming in the opposite direction to me. And this was a this was Labor Day, which is like a bank holiday here. So in the in like the back streets of Hollywood, you know, it should have been really quiet. So I was and then simultaneously as I twigged, oh, that was the day they were going to have this free uh, concert. Then the police charged from four directions onto the intersection where it was really going down. And uh, there was, for like five minutes, it was a full-on riot, the tear gas. And I heard they used rubber bullets. I didn't see that with my own eyes. So I, my van was stuck. Me and another car were just stuck. We had the police behind us, the kids in front of us. There was all kinds of missiles coming from the kids that were hitting our vehicles, and the police were firing tear gas from behind us. Uh, next thing you know, from the top of the street, from where the from where uh, the, one of the barricades was, you have a whole a whole group of uh, uh, police officers in riot gear on horses, uh, knocking people out of the way. Uh, yeah! They were just pushing in the line. Everybody that was in their way was getting pushed with the baton or pushed by the, you know, trying not to get trampled by a horse. Almost comically, I was listening to System of a Down at the time because I was currently reviewing the album. So I had the advanced disc in my car, which I hoped might offer me some semblance of protection. But anyway, in the end, I just abandoned the vehicle. All of a sudden, you know, you just have a stream of people running because, I mean, the cops, the cops came in full force. So it was almost like a stampede. News van drove by, they lucky if they didn't get their window busted or something thrown at a cameraman or... It was a mess. I mean, it's a really st stupid thing to have a riot over, you know? It's a rock concert. It's, it's trivia. It just, it was a good idea that just went terribly wrong, terribly bad. Somewhere in the, in the planning there was a flaw. Really laced with irony in, in terms of System of a Down's lyrics and, uh, you know, their whole approach, but... Uh... So System of a Down obviously likes to do free concerts every once in a while. They like to look out for their fans, but uh, yeah, it was just a hell of a day. You know, a lot of bands, I get press releases every day from bands who are trying to make out that they're so crazy, that these crazy things happen on the road and they're so out of control, none of which are true. They're all grossly exaggerated. And then this was one of those rare incidents where it really was out of hand, and I really expected systems people to milk it, because basically the whole thing was all about how popular they were, you know, and it made all the, national, the news around here, as you can imagine, it was on all the TV stations. Um, so I waited for my inbox to fill up with press releases, um, and it just didn't happen. They never did anything with it, and, uh, and good for them, because they really could have milked it, and uh, nothing was... I never heard one thing about it from the system camp at all. So. The next day, an article written by Serge entitled Circle of Fear appeared on the band's official website. Serge explained how System were desperate to play, but were prevented from doing so by the LAPD and fire departments. 
They blamed the authorities' lack of communication with the crowd and subsequent police intimidation for sparking things off. What was supposed to be a day of celebration ended in fear. Down are a 21st century rock group with key differences from their contemporaries. They operate as a self-contained unit, write electrically charged songs about politics, loss, anger and pain and constantly strive to push themselves artistically. In a media literate, corporate savvy age, where even the most credible acts are afraid to change, System of a Down constantly surprise and experiment with their art. The whole band is now kind of less kind of eager to please, they're doing their own thing more. And uh, you can see that in his live presentation. I mean, now the guy is just showing up in sweats and a t-shirt. I mean, he's the most unlikely front man in a most image conscious genre. And, uh, and it's a beautiful thing. They want to talk about rock music. They want to talk about the different bands. They always want to know, like, like the new hot bands. They definitely stay on top of that. You know, to, to giving me this, this type of opportunity, this much respect and and then no matter how much I was tired, I say, whoa, this is it. This is the real thing. They're different. Their sound was so different. Like, I couldn't compare it to anything at the time. If anything, it sounded like old, old punk. You know what I mean? Like 10, 15 year old punk with some metal hooks and just, just violence. It was just bad. So I liked it. It was like hearing Slayer for the first time. I thought it was illegal. You know, I shouldn't be doing this. The more time I spend with a band like System of a Down or a band like Tool, they are succeeding because of just timeless, just human qualities, just of respecting each other and supporting each other and understanding each other. So that in the rehearsal room, everyone feels free to pour out whatever ideas they've got because they don't get criticized, they don't get laughed at. You know, that everyone supports those ideas and will develop them to the fullest. I've had System of a Down come in the studio here with me a few times. Um, normally it's just two of the guys that come in. John the drummer is the number one talker of the band. And normally drummers in bands aren't the guys doing the interviews. But I mean he really has a fantastic personality and he's not afraid to show it. And I really like him. So I've had John in, I've had Shavo come in as well. And just fantastic guys, fun guys. We have a fun time on the radio. Uh, we'll screw around, but then when it's time to get serious, they're, they're really wise, smart, intelligent guys. Keen to distance themselves from a mass production pop world, System pay little attention to what's happening in the wider world of music. They do their own thing and concentrate on improving and honing their art. They started playing music to have fun and will continue together while that is still part of the equation. This remarkable group of musicians seem set to continue tearing down the boundaries, inventing new hybrid forms and irrevocably changing the rock landscape for many years to come. Why I support them? Because they're not lying. They're not taking advantage from the people enjoyment, you know? They're the best bunch of guys that, that could be doing this, you know. Uh, I, they don't have a big head, they're, they're very level-headed, they're still will walk down the street on Sunset Boulevard and, and talk to all their fans. Their overall angle is that they just, uh, they fear ignorance and they just encourage their, the listener just to pay attention and to try and inform his or herself um, because when you're ignorant you, ignorant you can be misled and when you're well informed you're less likely to be misled. Bands like, you know, uh, System of a Down and Rage Against the Machine and other artists who open our minds up to what's going on within the uh, outside our world, it's, it's important. All the guys stress they are not advocating a particular political party or a particular social climate. They're just asking that people think.